This is Ron Real Entrepreneurship, the show that brings the no-nonsense truth of what is required to start, grow, and scale your business. I am your host, Susan Sly. Well, hey, what is up, Ron Real Entrepreneurs, wherever you are in the world? I hope you are having an amazing day. And uh Yeah, we're going to talk about the S word on the show. And no, we don't have the E warning, but we are going to talk about sales today and especially sales as they relate to entrepreneurial ventures. And we're going to talk about why startups fail. We're going to talk about the economy. And um, my guest today has opinions on many things, but opinions that I definitely respect. He's become a friend. He has a 20 plus year business career that began in professional services at PwC, where before dying of boredom, he carved out a weird niche as a bash developer and checked the Fortune 500 box with UPS, JP Morgan Chase, and Aetna. And if you've ever received a package or deposited a check, there's a pretty decent chance some piece of code he wrote was somehow involved. From there, he went into publishing. And just when the web was overtaking newspapers, and you know, many of you know, I read an actual newspaper on the weekend, so it hasn't totally taken them away, uh, and periodicals, giving him a front row seat to disruption and honing his taste for entrepreneurial pursuits while also learning how sales and ops must gel for customer success. He then went on to walk out of a stable job and say, forget all this nonsense. I am taking charge of my own destiny. So on top of everything, he's a a sales expert. He's a leading podcast host, but he's also a dad of five kids, which most respect to that. It's incredible. So my guest today is the one, the only, the founder of Ad One Zero, Mr. David Ledgerwood. And some people call him Ledge, but I'm going to call him David. So David, welcome to Ron Real Entrepreneurship. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that dramatic read of my uh <laughs> my past so it's storied and ugly in places but uh you hit the highlights so you know it's it's isn't it all learning out there you know you look back at your early adventures and you go yeah i wouldn't have bought that from myself so um you know <laughs> it's just, wow yeah it's it's a journey well the there's so many things that we're going to discuss in today's episode. And I want to talk about career pivots. I want to talk about building a business. I want to talk about startup failure, but I'm going to jump right in. Um, So here we are, depending on when someone is listening and we have the um, conflict in the Middle East. And I use that word lightly. We have America printing money like crazy, more money in the last four years than um, all the previous three decades combined. We have, um, I read this morning in the news, David, that the uh, the mortgage rates have gone up again and the average family is spending um, close to $1,000 more per month than they were even three or four years ago. And we see startups as a result of um, this being the worst year to raise money in decades. We see a lot of, a lot of startups shutting their doors. People aren't starting um, startups like they were before. And here you are specializing in the lifeblood of what a startup needs, which is sales. So has this economy, in your most humble but accurate opinion, affected the ability of the average entrepreneur to sell? I did. So uh, qualitatively or quantitatively speaking, I can say now some 15 years in that I have not seen a Q2-3 with such low lead volume across clients and businesses. So, I mean, it was a truly dismal summer, you know, just absolutely across the board. And and I don't, I, I think there's like the, there's the macroeconomic story that is kind of, you know, sort of playing out, right? And then, you know, in addition to that, you see all kinds of things like, I don't know, like, I almost felt like there was like, vastly more vacation this summer. And Mm -hmm. I just wonder if that was like, there's still this sort of COVID hangover, you know, that Mm -hmm. is kind of like, to hell with this, like, everybody's still burned out. 
three years later, and I'm actually going to take time off. I have never gotten so many out of office messages as I did. Like the decision makers just checked out this mm-hmm. summer. And and on the plus side, I can say that going into Q4, it looks like it's going to be the usual and absolute madness. Like there is pent up demand. So anybody that made it through, at least in the, the sectors that I'm involved in, like actually it looks kind of like pretty hot running into the end of the year. So if anything, and in my experience, like, so now I've been through, I've had the the blessing of having started businesses in all of the once a lifetime, you know, economic collapses that have happened, you know, since I started these adventures and, you know, they're only supposed to happen once every hundred years. And now I've had three of them, you know, so I, I don't know if that's like, you know, climate change or something where, you know, we're just gonna have worse storms every, you know, more often, but um, I can, viscerally think back to 2008 and I had, I had raised money and, you know, I was going into the end of the year and, you know, brand new company. And, you know, it was, it was small. We were half a million run rate, but I mean, things were hot. We were staffing up and then it went to zero, like literally zero dollars of revenue. Like the instant the clock switched to 2009, everyone canceled everything. And I burned all the money. I paid a bunch of people and I shut the doors in six months. And I mean, gosh, that's like, that's, I still remember that. So that never leaves you. I I would say that, you know, cash, cash is still king. And I became obsessed with this idea that like revenue is, revenue is just everything. Like it's like the gas in the car. I don't care what your car is. Revenue is it. And and I just said, why aren't we teaching? And I, I was involved in the you know, startup accelerator space and, you know, all these things. And it was all about raising money. And I was like, why the hell aren't we teaching people about revenue? Like, that's it. Like, it's the cheapest financing. It's the one that is going to keep you alive no matter what. And you can bank cash. Like, just do that. Like, and and we're we're killing companies by teaching them, like, this is all about making a slide deck and and pitching for VC money. And it just drove me absolutely nuts. So I'm now just out there waving the revenue flag, you know, all the time. And yes, sales as a function is part of that, but it's like the 20%, not the 80%. And you're mm. talking about revenue function is the primary core reason we exist. That's why we have companies. And and that's not some like sort of you know, sort of capitalist manifesto or anything like that. It's literally like, you can't run the car without gas. And let's just have that conversation first. So that's, I go out and bang my cowbell on a regular basis about revenue. So I think, I think it's a great cowbell to bang. And, and we're seeing too, even the startups that I'm invested in, um, for example, one of them, AIM7. And I've had Dr. Eric Coram on the show a couple of times and just as a sidebar, full disclosure, you can see my investments on studentsly.com. And of the 322 founders I've interviewed, I've invested in four of their companies. But the the thing I would say is that as I'm watching, say, AIM go out and pitch in Silicon Valley and so forth, that they've got a, a you know a month over month revenue story. It's not big revenue, but it's that growth. And to your point, David, that you know, the VCs, they want to see revenue, they want to see growth, they want to see your projections, but they not necessarily this pie in the sky, like, show me what you think your revenue is going to be five years from now. Like, let's look at the solid 18 to 24 months. Let me ask you this question. Um, In your opinion, and I'm very curious about this, what is familiar about what's happening in the economy now versus what was happening during the recession and what do you think is different? Because I want to get into how you recovered after closing a company. But, you know, I know for some of us of a a certain level of wisdom that, you know, some people listening, you were toddlers during the last recession. David and I were not. And so I keep thinking, David, there's some things that are familiar and there are are some things that are very different. But I, I, you know, just as friends, I want to know your perspective on it. Yeah. You know, there are materially different things. I mean, the interest rate situation is real, you know, and I don't think like the vast majority of people 
who are actively doing business now just haven't been in a situation where money wasn't free yeah. and it's not going to be and you have to go back to where we were practically toddlers or at the very least like you know our parents had 17 percent mortgages or whatever in you know the the 80s right and none of us remembers that you know so that i think is is dramatically different like capital is going to be expensive except again revenue right so like that's important uh when you talk about like preparation for downturns or you know being ready to have dry powder like that it's still the same right put some money back we intentionally build in our businesses like a reserve fund like that we it's it's almost like your personal finances where you have an emergency fund like we don't pay ourselves all the money that we could we make sure that we're banking money and and we can make smart investments when we need to at that point so because there is 20 grand here or 20 grand there where you can kind of go let's now invest in building that new program when the market's down and if you don't have that and you don't have that protective layer i mean everything's about runway and and cash flow analysis and so in a sense that hasn't changed except that you have nowhere to hide like you're going to go get a line of credit for 27 percent now like you can't factor your invoices for free anymore and you aren't going to be able to entice anyone to give you money when risk-free money is going to pay them a pretty damn good interest rate like you you are risky. You're you're vastly more risky than than anything. And again, the only money that you can get is is revenue that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. So um, I think that's the same, but more poignant than it was back. You know when now and and you also have like ubiquitous information flow that you just didn't have before. You know and um, therefore, you know, all information is public information and, um, and there's some positives, right? Like we can all access a remote workforce in a way that we couldn't before, you know, like that was revolutionary, you know, 10 years ago. And now it's just like, yeah, we're all on zoom. Like, I don't, I don't even know where you are and you know, that we can have a relationship and we can build stuff together. I have a, my core business partner. I've been in the same room with her six times in 20 years, you know, like you can, you can do that. And you didn't used to be able, you know, mm. to do those things. So I'm by and large, I'm an optimist, but these are, these are challenging times when you can kind of look at it and go like, what if all the money stopped for my business? Like how long would I last? And I think having been through that once, like you just have, like, you have this, we are optimists, right? We're entrepreneurs. Like we make some, something out of nothing. But I just, I just want to like impress on people that in fact, nothing can be a zero, like an actual zero. You can have no money. <laughs> and, and I think that unless you've been through that, you can discount that idea. <laughs> Definitely. And then to your point, it's really interesting because operationally, the, what is so different than the recession was that some of the the startups I know they they never had an office and there's this whole debate like everyone needs to be back in the office. A startup shouldn't be comparing itself to what you know Meta is mandating or what whoever is mandating. These are multi billion dollar companies that were started during the last recession. You can keep your operational costs down by using overseas talent, by not having an office, which is an expense. Um, and like you said, having that cash flow reserve, I think, is so critical. So how did you manage emotionally when that business um, stopped? I mean, yeah, straight up, like you're talking about raw, like it, it just gutted me. Like I probably drank too much <laughs> and yeah. you know I, I shut my business and what I would say is that having a good network and having this you know sort of 
collection of skills, like it was still an important thing. So at, th- at that point, I, you know, shut the doors and on Friday and Monday, I picked up a consulting gig. And so, I mean, one thing I can tell entrepreneurs that has been helpful to me, and, and I'll qualify this and say that, like, I work in B2B services. I don't have tech companies. I, I, I have human powered things that are technology enabled and we deliver services, you know, so it's, it's materially different in that way. So I I can't speak to what do you do, you know, to start your next tech, next tech startup. I mean, I probably could speak to it, but you know, that's not my wheelhouse. Um, But you know, what, what I have always done is I've maintained this idea of uh, a side consulting company that is always my company and that is always, live and you know Mm -hmm. sort of like it's there it actually doesn't do anything but i can always jump to the next income making gap filling endeavor because i have that and i think that that's been really important for surviving the troughs where you know i i've I'm on business 16 some of them were really tremendously bad and you know and like i I learned of myself that I'm generally a better follow on founder. I'm, you know, I'm the guy that can scale things better than I'm the, my ideas generally suck, you know, so, or, or they're like 15 years too early. So I, I have fun stories of like, I swear I invented Foursquare, you know, before, but like nobody will believe me, but um, so, you know, I, I think it's weird, right? Like people will tell you like burn the bridges or, you know, you're and and in a sense, like I, I burned all the bridges of saying I'm never going to go have a real job again because I just can't, I'm not really good at working, you know, for people. Like I got fired a lot, you know, kind of had like a chip on my shoulder and, but I always did have a backup plan that was me and a different bucket of me Mm. and that I could deploy that asset, you know, kind of differently. Like that was a fallback plan. I wasn't drawing a salary on somebody's W2 but I was able to provide services that were valuable. So always have that, maybe that's the pivot of like the startup of me, not any given company. And I also became able to really not treat them like they're not your children. They're not actual living entities, like any brand logo name, like none of these things actually should have an emotional hook for you. Like they're, they're, your guppies and and a lot of them are going to get eaten and not grow up and don't get attached. Like that's not a thing. You're a thing. Your family is a thing. Like those are real physical, emotional entities. And I see so many, particularly first time entrepreneurs, you know, get hung up in this, like, and I did it too. And I'm just like, maybe it's like the rite of passage, but I'm going to spend like days upon days designing my logo and website and my color schemes and all this bullshit. And like, it doesn't matter. And the most successful businesses I've had correlation, not causation. I don't know, but it's like, I made up a name in the shower. I went in my hard drive, took a logo that I paid somebody to make for some other thing that failed and changed the word. And people love it now, (laughs) you know? And I think like, that's, really what what matters is like build that you know sort of collection of of your real emotional hooks and build that self-awareness and then come and you know try out stuff as you know a business like that's really what you know it's funny because when you finally actually make something work and i have failed so monumentally in doing that so many times that like i can look back and say yeah it's because i did it all wrong so many times that I just recognize the pattern of that. And it looks like you're successful but you, until you think like, it took me 16 tries to do that. <laughs> you know, like, A lot of singles, a lot of strikeouts. And then finally, like, it's almost like, holy shit, we actually make money. Like, <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know, maybe that that's the disease of entrepreneurship, but it's also the blessing. I hope you enjoyed part one of this interview with David Ledgerwood and we take your feedback seriously. One thing we see is that when a show is around 30 minutes, we get more downloads than if it's an hour. And I get it. 
most entrepreneurs have very short attention spans. So in the next episode, David and I are going to be talking about entrepreneurial anxiety and how do you really come back from losing a business and starting over? It's profound. And the thing I want to say to you about entrepreneurship is a lot of you have this fear of starting a business, of taking the leap, of saying, hey, I'm going to leave my full-time job and I'm going to build a business. And the thing I want you to know is the majority of entrepreneurs actually do it part-time. And so as you're listening to not just this show, but other episodes, know that most of the people that you hear, all of these success stories, they started maybe with one or two hours a day or some time on the weekends to get their idea really, really going before they go all in. And what you're going to hear from David in the next episode is that he always has a side business set up that he can just turn a switch and go anytime he wants, which is a great idea for each and every one of us. So with that, I want to thank you for being here. God bless. Go rock your day. And I will see you in the next episode. Are you currently an employee looking to start your own business? Maybe you've been thinking about it for a while and you're just not sure where to start. Well, my course, Employee to Entrepreneur, combines my decades of experience as an entrepreneur with proven methods, techniques, and skills to help you take that leap and start your own business. This course is self-paced, learn on demand, and comes with an incredible workbook. And that will allow you to go through this content piece by piece by piece, absorb it, take action, and then go on to the next module. So check out my course on susansly.com, Employee to Entrepreneur.